Well, welcome everyone. Hello, I'm Deborah Gardner, host of Hospitality Today Live, and welcome to our 11th episode with already over 6,000 viewers, which is just incredible thanks to you. And, um, you know, Today, we, we definitely have something unique and different here. We actually um, will have my longtime industry friend, uh, John Chan, the author of his already selling, uh, number one selling book, Engaging Virtual Meetings. And um, he will be joining us very soon. But I wanted to at least give you a, uh, a pre-show, why not, with someone that I really respect very well and uh, wanted to introduce to you all for a long, long time. And I believe that is going to be uh, my very good friend, Lisa Raymond, who happens to be with Visibly Media. So Lisa's going to talk with us today about technology and her also involvement with uh Toastmasters and another other things that she feels is happening in, in today's world. And then we will bring John Chan in to, uh, to really talk about the engaging virtual meetings. So let's bring Lisa in right now. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Deborah. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for jumping in here since John had some uh, things to take care of before uh, joining us today. Um, but I'm delighted to have you because you and I have been working together for a long time and honored to do so because you are just fantastic. And but you are the owner, the founder, um, and the president of Visibly Media. Can you share with us what you do? Certainly. Visibly Media is a marketing platform that specializes in social media engagement and inbound marketing strategies, which usually involves email. We also do graphic design and website design for people so that way they can get their businesses out there more strategically and communicate more strategically with their audience. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And so you also do web webinars, uh, webinars, you do websites, you create websites. Um, I believe your husband is involved with uh, a lot of the web technology side of things, uh, kind of like a duo between the two of you, right? <laughs> can be, yes. And we try not to step on each other if we can help that sometimes. But uh, he runs a hosting company called Phoenix Hosting and help will host websites and whatnot. And then he also has another side of his business called Phoenix VOIP, which is Voice Over Internet Protocol. This is something that they were just getting started in to trying to get their feet wet in right before the pandemic. So about December or November of last year. And it has gone really well. They've gotten a lot of feedback on that. Some some challenges as you're going, you know, doing a new business, but that's going to happen no matter what your business is. But they're really excited about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think technology right now is just booming in all kinds of different areas. Um, but you also help in the hospitality industry as well. One of the places is, is with me and my business, but other speakers, other entities, um, you belong to Toastmasters. So uh, what do you see happening out there? What are, what are some of the, the conversations that are going on regarding what's going on today? Well, other than people are almost pandemic exhausted, not so much weary or whatnot. They're just exhausted by it, honestly. But at the same point, they're also trying to position themselves in the best possible light as to what they can do to take advantage of the technology now. How do they use it to get their business out there? How do they get heard above the noise? If they stay into what they are doing and what their strength is, their strategy will come through. Then they just garner their own audience from that point on. With Toastmasters, we're out there, we're a membership driven organization and our key is that we're trying to talk about professional and personal development. So if you're looking to develop some leadership skills, now would be the time to do it. <laughs> if you're looking at polishing up your speech, your presentations, whatnot, especially with this online environment, this is also a great way to do so. Practicing skills in a non-critical manner. So we do critique people, but it's not criticize, it's evaluate. And it really has helped people within industries such as Cox Communications really help get them in front of their customers and help them to speak more eloquently when they're talking with them about problem resolution and whatnot. We found that that's been a very good tool there. For the rest of technology, it's again trying to figure out what makes sense for them to use based on where your audience is. So if most of your audience is your CEOs 
or even some HR professionals like you give in the hospitality industry, you're probably better off on LinkedIn over Facebook. And that's only because Facebook has 3 billion people. That's a ton of eyeballs, a ton of posts to have to get by. Your decision makers are still on LinkedIn. That would make more sense than to try and connect with them as well. Maintain a reputation on Facebook, but not to necessarily put all your money in to develop it in one direction or the other. Just maintaining that, I think, in my opinion as well. Also, would depend on which, no, no political bend in either direction here. If you're not a fan of being censored, I wouldn't necessarily go in there anyway because they could decide to censor you based on whether or not you're paying them enough money versus whether or not you're actually putting out a good message. If you're not paying anybody to get your message out there, your views are diminished in the first place. If mm -hmm. you're not paying more than your competitor, would they actually censor you over competitor? I don't know the answer to that right now. I would hope they wouldn't, but I also never thought I'd see them censor other people based on opposite viewpoints anyway, which is happening. So my recommendation on there, again, just maintain a presence, see how things are going and what they do and prepare a plan B with a different platform in case you find that that's too stifling for your business to be seen. Wow, that's a lot of great information. And a lot of people and the viewers that we have right now, which again, we're, we're growing by every episode that we have. Um, yep. <laughs> you actually get the opportunity and, and I get the opportunity to work with you to work behind the scenes here at Hospitality, Hospitality Today Live. Uh, you're my show producer. Um, <laughs> viewers can see why right now look at the wealth of information that you bring to the table Thank you. and at the same time you understand you know the market of, of the hospitality uh world um you you've got you know you go to toastmasters like you mentioned you're you're involved in that side of it so i couldn't have more of a perfect person to uh to produce this show so thank you from the bottom of my heart and uh, this i know is a lot of fun um, <laughs> oh yeah, we are having a lot of fun, right? A, a lot of the back of the the scenes that people just don't know about, right? <laughs> right. Uh, last minute things like you know hiccups where you know John's going to be joining us, but it's like, hey, you never know what's going to happen minute to minute. So, so for to have you, my show producer, hop on board here was was a delight. And and again, the the part about what you're talking about with. Um, uh, Toastmasters, you're seeing a lot of inspiring speakers that want to present at meetings and events, um, maybe even, you know, entertain on cruise lines or, or, you know, there's so, there's so many areas, segmentations to the hospitality industry. Um, what are you seeing is some positiveness in their, in their, their conversations at these meetings and are they inspired to, I mean, I know you mentioned some of that, but are they, they're really hanging in there. And I mean, it's, it's tough when you're first coming into this business. So kudos to them for, for sticking in there. Right. Right. And I really appreciate that. There are very steadfast and persistent, you know, persistency is the key to anything in my opinion, even in business. One of the things that really came clear to me in what I do for a living, I joined Toastmasters because I really wanted to do what you do and get on stage in front of like thousands of people. I'm not sure where my head was, but that's what I wanted to do. And in my own life with my business coach, they told me, you need to go to Toastmasters. You're not necessarily presenting as professionally as you could be. When I did, I found out that my own club wanted to improve one-on-one -on -one communication. They had no desire whatsoever to get in front of a stage, which was fine. They can do that. And that's why I like the organization because it fits your needs, whether it's one-to-one -one or one-to-many. It's here to help you with your path and your journey, which is unique to all of us. Right, right. And I think when we're talking about speakers and Toastmasters, if we look back to the recession and how we've had to start from scratch before, it seemed like a lot of CEOs stepped in for a little while because of budget restraints. Do you see that that happening right now? Do you think a lot of CEOs are, are at Toastmasters trying to learn their presentation skills too? I think so, because they're having to get in front of an audience that they're not used to being in front of, that right. they may have had to do things one-on-one, -on -one, but this screen thing, what we're doing even now, really threw people off where everyone had to just jump in to do something, and they weren't sure what that looked like, what it would do, or what even how people would respond to it. But it has proven to be a very valuable tool because we can stay in touch with people whether right. it's our CEOs to the decision makers, like people like you and I. Um, in the hospitality world, for example, I have a newsletter that just popped up on my screen that said the resorts world 
is hiring 6,000 workers. And this comes out of Las Vegas, but I think that's going to be more global. I'll get you some information on that, but that's a plus. Keeping in touch with what's going on with the hospitality industry, which to me has been way disparaged and pinned as one of the super spreaders, which to me, uh, you've got to give me some evidence first. I haven't seen that. Just because you can gather doesn't mean that you're going to do something and spread anything as far as that goes. Right, with right. That, it depends on what people can be flexible with. I spent about four weeks training people on how to use Zoom, how to get online, whether it was there on a couple of occasions, Google Meets on one, Microsoft Teams. I've had to learn four different platforms, but oh. trying to meet their needs based on whatever they need, whether they need something that's less expensive, like a Zoom or even Jitsi. How much right. time do they have? Do they need to buy the time? How are we going to do this? And now we're preparing our clubs on how to do contests online, which we opted not to do in the spring this year. We're definitely going to dive into it this year and see how it works. Wow, interesting. Well, I know a lot of us have had Zoom fatigue, and we're going to talk more about that when John comes on board here in another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but I do want to let you know that you've already got some comments and some questions that have come across our screen. So I'd like to share those with you, Lisa. Um, first of all, Randall, who is always such a great um, support of the show. Yes. He says <laughs> that our, you know, their, their Toast Matters, Masters Club is meeting on Zoom. Opportunities to practice virtual presentations, including humor. Oh my gosh, yep. how hard is it to do humor on a virtual call? <laughs> it's actually harder than you think. I get more anxiety driven on a Zoom call sometimes than I do in person. I'm not sure how that works, but he's right. Humor itself is not that easy to do, whether you're in person or online. Sometimes it's easier in person because you can get your props behind you and you can stage it. How do you do that online? And we're all learning on how to do that. So kudos to Randall for doing that. In international ourselves, I don't know what the numbers are. In Arizona, about 80 to 85% of our clubs are meeting online right now. And moving toward a hybrid environment, depending upon what they're going to do and what their host is doing. So with my right. home club, we have a meeting room, a boardroom really, that will let us have about half of our meeting space, half of our audience, and we can still have people engage with us online. So we're preparing for the technology how that looks. Some of our clubs, not so fortunate for that, but hopefully then we can share other content or other rooms depending upon the availability of those hosts and see if we can get them all up and running. Right, because we know that the meetings and events industry, the entire hospitality uh, world is just on hold um, due to COVID. As a matter of fact, um, a yeah. lot of these, you know, the, uh, yes, the leisure and the, the BT area is going to, you know, start coming back and the smaller meetings and everything. What we want is the large meetings and, right. and those hotels <laughs> are the ones that are, are really, you know, suffering. And uh, David, you know, Kilman says it perfectly. Um, what he mentioned, you know, the, re the resorts um, world, uh, which is, you know, a new Malaysian owned resort. He knows that's located opposite of the wind in, in Vegas. You know, oh. they're, they're supposed to open pretty soon, but now due to COVID, we just don't know. I know a lot of them are saying 2024, but do we even know? And, and can technology help push this area that, um, you know, I know the hybrid's going to be great and it's been around for 10 to 15 years, but I guess that's what we're going to have to deal with until we can get these other resorts to open up, right? Right. And I don't know how much of that has to do with revenue to the state because part of Vegas is also driven by the meetings, if not a large part of it, really. I mean, the consumerism is the visitor and the meetings themselves. I don't know. And maybe David can speak to that. Do they actually get revenue then from these meetings and how much of that that may be driving yeah. some of that statistic as well? Are they able then to open? Are they not able to open? Why? What's the data? And I think they have to, as one of your guests pointed out a week or so ago, you have to go back to the data and find out, okay, what are things showing us? If there is no data that says that the meetings are the cause of the pandemic, then let's open them up and see what happens. Do it responsibly, but do a hybrid. So you can have you know, what the minimum is or the maximum is allowed by that governor and still have them online as well. Right, right. So do you have any tips that our viewers can um, think about, uh, to prepare for uh, when it comes to hybrid meetings, to technology in general? <laughs> Absolutely. One of the things they have to have is a laptop or a desktop or even a mobile device that has a good camera. 
the first and foremost thing is that you have to realize that we moved into an online world faster than we were prepared to do, even my little laptop. The camera may not have caught up with it, so I'm looking at getting a different camera for that. Uh, you can see, number two, the other quick thing would be to get us green screen. So I opted to not turn on green screen for our talk so that people could see. It can be just as wide as a closet door drape it up, pull it up, whatever you need to do. And that way you can have a virtual background that can have you anywhere. Or what I like to do is doing promotion with your background. So you should have your logo on there, your name. That way when you're talking with customers or doing a presentation, they remember who you are. It's not much different really than the backdrop banners like you're using at Hospitality Today Live. <clears throat> the other thing would be to make sure that you have a good mic like a boom mic here. If you're gonna use earbuds like these guys I have here, they fit right in your ear. Make sure that they're charged, which mine are not, that's why I have my headset on today. Make sure they're charged, make sure the microphone works, test your equipment before you go online. Making sure that wherever your camera is, look right at the camera. This is where your audience will connect with you. So if you think about how we do things on a stage, we can look at the people in the audience and connect with them with our eyeballs. Our eyeball just got really small. It's right up in your laptop and it's right in front of you. So you wanna make sure that you're always connecting with that and keeping your eyes on your audience at all times. Last thing, when you test your equipment, test the sound, even do a little recording and then play it back. Listen to how it sounds, how your diction sounds, your tone, whether you're too soft or too loud. And that way, Deborah, they'll know how they suppo they're supposed to really respond to things online, but how their tonality will work. And that way they don't come across as screeching or yelling, any of that nature, and they won't come across so soft that people really have to strain to hear them. You can use that to your advantage to make points, but if the entire broadcast is like that, then they're gonna lose the point that they're trying to make and they may lose the audience at the same point. Yeah, and it's a work in progress. I mean, uh, we here at Hospitality Today Live are always changing it up every every week, right, Lisa? Yeah. We're, we're trying something new and different. But I think, and I believe, we are on the same same you know the, the right track here uh, because Lynn Wellish, who happens to be a, a big supporter of this show too, her <laughs> husband actually said he likes the set. All right. <laughs> And Zach uh, loves, the, loves the presentation. The new set looks sharp, too. So we are constantly, constantly uh, trying to, to up our game um, every, every week. And it's so great that everybody is so um, uh, appreciative and, and patient uh, because we, we, I mean, this was a crash course. It was oh, a yeah. crash course for so many people. I know on the speaking world, speakers are spending thousands of dollars. And just the four tips that you gave, um, it doesn't sound like it would really cost that much. Is there is there particular places to go and get this kind of equipment or, or, or how do you know? I mean, I've got like three different uh, wireless mics here and I still don't know how to use them. So it's <laughs> like, you know, did we hire someone like you to come in and, you know, help re restructure the whole uh, uh, set? How, how does that work? What, what's the next thing people need to do once they get the equipment? They should test it out. And first of all, don't be afraid because no one is doing this 100% perfect. So if you think someone's going to judge you, it's, it's good to go. Don't worry about being perfect. Worry about getting it out there and getting it better and better and improving it as you go. You can have someone test the equipment with you. I could come over, you know, with all the PPE so that way we're not super spreading ourselves and whatnot and see what your equipment is doing and how it's working as far as that goes, especially if you're local here in Arizona. The um, one of the apps that I obviously love using is Zoom. I think it's an easy platform. You have the waiting room installed. You can monitor it so that way you keep those Zoom bombers out of there. And you can also ma manage the equipment a little bit easier as far as that goes. For anything else, it's just a trial and error. We found out that one of your cameras didn't work well, so we got a different camera. The one mic that you had wasn't working as well as you wanted to when you went to the new studio, so you got a different microphone there. It's just going and going. I like to see what deals are on Amazon because I think they're probably the better ones for trying to aggregate all that stuff and getting it one place. I've got a deal now working at Best Buy for my next camera, which will mount to my laptop and have a microphone pitch to it. So I may get to lose these, which would be super nice. And I'd have to something like Luke and Leia from Star Wars having something stuck in my ears all the time. But we'll right. work and see how that goes. And if I find that's not working, I'll go back to my headset. It's good to go. The message is more important than the presentation.
as yeah, far as that, that goes. So again, don't be true. afraid, just jump in. It's all about content. Well, and there's a lot of little things that, that change with the technology too. And, and John, who's going to be here on the, on the show very soon here, and I, I hope everybody will stick around as well. Um, yes, please. But he, taught, <laughs> he taught me to draw the window shades down. Now I've always been told the more light, the better and face the window. And, um, but you kind of, like you said earlier, you got to test it out. And he was right. Once I put my shades down, it's like, voila, you know, all of a yep. sudden you can see everything better. It was, it was very enlightening. And it's those little tiny things that, that really make a difference, isn't it? Right. It does. And in my case, I can't move my desk. It weighs about 300 pounds. So for me to try and move my desk over to where my blinds are, and I can open a little bit to see a little light, wouldn't work very well. And when I did open my blinds on this end, I got a lot of good light on the one side. I got a lot of shadow on this side, which didn't work. So I have a ring light that's posted up right above my computer, but you could go down to, to Home Depot and get a floodlight for a whole lot cheaper than what I paid for my ring light. I can't adjust that brightness or that intensity or even the color, but it does serve its purpose. So it depends on what you're trying to do. And again, what's gonna work best for your individual situation. Right, right. And and it's amazing how many people are out there to help, you know, like yourself and and like John, who's going to be on the show in a minute. And, and you know, it's just amazing how people are so giving. Um, as a matter of fact, David Kilman, who will be on the show <laughs> next month, he hey. has, has a great list of equipment and he's happy to share. David, why don't you uh, also put in the comments your um, contact information so yeah. everybody listening, and, and I believe it, I believe the value is probably even more than $1,000, David. I bet it's more than that because it's it's priceless right now because without it, without putting on a virtual meeting or a Zoom meeting or, or a hybrid of any sort, you're going to be left in the dust. So you <laughs> might as well get used to this new, what I call the now normal, the current normal. Um, it's, yeah. it's every day is going to be new. So David, put in your, <laughs> your contact information and we'll give that to people later. But I do have a question uh, that Lynn Wellish has for you, Lisa. What okay. recording app do you recommend? Zoom or Hackman or is there anything else out there? I think Lynn meant hop in because we are looking at that now for Toastmasters International, at least here in Arizona. So great question. I like Zoom, but that's also because I'm familiar with it. Having said that, I'm going to get real familiar, I think, with Hopin because after we do our analysis and we'll know before the end of this week, this may be the platform that we use to put on our own virtual fair that we're going to plug here, hopefully very shortly. We're planning on doing this in January. And what that would do then is allow us to have people come in as sponsors, have attendees, basically just like the Small Business Expo, if some of you are familiar with that, where they used, I think, Boomset to help set up their virtual platform. This will be a little different. It's a different platform. I've heard a lot of good things about Hopin, but I can't make the comparison yet, Lynn, because I haven't used it yet. So I'll be able to tell you about that more at probably about the third week of June. And I'd love to come back on and do a report for that. But at the moment, Zoom, because I'm more familiar with it, they obviously have been really good about letting the kids jump in and the school districts for free. That was so prime. And the fact that it's really easy to use, I can use it on my phone, my mobile device, my laptop, which is I'm on now. I look for that flexibility. Whereas when you're looking for a fair, whether it's a job fair or an information fair, like we're doing for Toastmasters, hop in or platforms like that would probably be better because you're trying to increase your membership and your awareness and help the community at the same time, which is what we're looking at. So we're narrowing it down, I think now to four and we're going to make our report then for our leadership at the end of the week. But I would love to come back and answer that once I've got some experience with that other platform. We'll hold you to that. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> and then as far as the equipment, David. Okay, David, you're right. I have to say your name right. Kilman, right? Right? Oh, I've, Kleiman, known I think. <laughs> I've, uh, I've known David for how long? And I can't say his last name yet. What the <laughs> heck? Well, anyway, there's his contact information. And I'm sure he'll set me straight uh, next month when I have him as a guest on my show, which I'm really, really excited. So right. thank you, David. Um, and then uh, Zach has a uh, comment for us as well. Um, okay. Do you recommend green screens for people doing Zoom from home? 
or should we use natural or vinyl backgrounds instead? Ah, mm. Very cool question. That goes back again to what we're doing with Hospitality Today Live. It depends again on the individual situation. So for me, which obviously I'm going to cheat and say, here's my virtual background, even though it's not up. That's what I prefer because I don't want people to see what's behind me. And I'm not going to tell you what's there other than it's actually organized, which is fine. <laughs> but for every individual situation, it's different. If you've got something that looks fairly professional and you're doing just an informal chat, honestly, from home in a natural environment would work just fine, but you have to be careful of the lighting and make sure that you don't have shadows and whatnot coming in for that natural lighting. A vinyl background may work, but it also may bounce back on your camera. So let me explain that a minute, Zach. With a bounce back, it may have a sheen or a shine to it. And what that might do is it may cause your camera to go, eh, and then you get all the fuzzies and whatnot that go around your frame, anytime you move your hand and whatnot, and that gets very distracting. So again, having the right camera and having the right background works. This one I managed to pick up from Amazon after I tried one from Hobby Lobby, and I think I got the wrong one from them. It did have a shine to it, and oh, let me tell you, the fuzzies were fuzzy. <laughs> and that's not them, that was just me picking up the wrong thing. So Hobby Lobby is a good source for that. People I have heard have gotten good results from just going to a dollar store and getting a tablecloth. You want to make sure it's got a good chroma, but as long as you've got that deep green, almost like a forest green type of thing, you can use a virtual background. And then if you're using this for your business, whether you're advertising your podcast or your new second gig, you know, your side gig that you're trying to do for business or whatnot, or your primary gig that you're doing for business, I would recommend branding it with a background that's got your logo on it, got your name, what you're doing. So that way people can see who you are. They remember who you are. And that gets branded into their mind without trying to be funny, gets branded into their mind. So that way it hits the reticular activator that says, oh, I heard Zach, he does this. Or here, here's David Kleiman. He's got that microphone. He's got that podcast. I know he did this because his name was on his virtual background. So that's what I'd recommend there. But it depends, again, on each individual, individual circumstance. Right. And that's a very, very good question. So what about um, on... Um, how about going on location? You know, everybody's in their home, you know, right. in a hobby hole in our, in our office. What if we went on location, like down at Starbucks and we did the Zoom? Is there <laughs> any rules to, or tips to abide by? Because like, if you were in, you know, if you were in um, uh, Starbucks or something, you, you got a lot of noise to deal with. That's true. And John can probably speak a little bit more to this. Cause I know he does like a lot more than I do with this. I would recommend gauging it for the sound. And if you can go in during a time of day where the sound is down, unless that ambient noise adds to your broadcast, I would say go ahead and try that. Avoid outdoors, especially if your outdoors happens to be near a street, like a busy major street, because that noise will come through. And that may not be something that you want to have bleed through. Uh, one experience that I had in jumping on as a last minute host for someone on a webinar, I was trying to feed questions to a Oh my God, to someone that was asking questions, they were doing a presentation. I said, yeah, Steve, I can get you those questions. Hang on. I was traveling between Arizona and Nevada. I'm babysitting my granddaughter so that way my daughter and my son-in-law can actually get some work done and not lose right. their job. And this right. was at night, which I had said, we're not doing night meetings. I did this one. I violated myself and I paid for it. I tried to feed the questions. They all got rowdy in the background and then they felt very bad about it. Right. So we wow. had to re-record that entire segment rather than having the live interaction. But they were okay with it because they realized there were some things we couldn't do. So if you can't do something, don't try to do it just to see how it'll work. But it depends. So like for an informal chat with what we did when we first launched, in your living room, in a coffee shop, that would have been phenomenal. Just to hear all that clinking and whatnot, that kind of adds to it. But don't do it right. if it's going to cause a distraction. Right, right. Wow. What a wealth of information. I cannot thank you enough, Lisa, for jumping on board here and uh, giving us your brilliancy and and information. Um, of course, you and I are having lunch later today, so we'll uh, definitely get some more strategies in place for the show, and I'm looking forward to it. So, um, John is going to be joining us here next. So I just, again, want to say thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Deborah, for this opportunity. I appreciate you. I appreciate working on here. And thanks, everybody, for listening. I really appreciate it. And stay tuned. John Chen is up next. Absolutely. 
Well, and thank you again for hanging in there with us. We really, really appreciate uh, the the opportunity to uh, share Lisa's wisdom with you all as my show producer here. She's phenomenal, as you can tell. And now I'm really, really excited to introduce to you my longtime friend, John Chen, the author of his already number one selling book, Engaging Virtual meetings. And uh, no wonder, I mean, because think about this, John has worked with over 2,400 companies worldwide, helping their virtual meetings become incredibly engaging, putting them in the top 1% of what they do. And personally, John is my go-to person when I want to be sure that my webinars, my Zoom programs are going to be successful. So let's bring John on right now. Hey, John. Hey, Deborah. how are you doing? <laughs> Oh, we're doing great now that you're here, but we did have a great conversation with Lisa. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right. And thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, just to, to highlight what I was working on, four language webinar. So oh. we had English, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Spanish all in the same Zoom webinar. Uh, it's our third wow. time doing it. Wow. Well, we're just honored that you were able to jump onto your fifth call. <laughs> now, I, I usually don't have the opportunity or even want to talk about someone's book as the main topic of the show. However, your book has everything to do with the meetings and events industry. Yes, engaging virtual meetings because of the fact that we are in a virtual meeting and event world and there is nothing more disengaging when a virtual meeting um, is not engaging. I know you agree with that. And planners, you know, planners know how to plan meetings. I mean, they're experienced in that and they have hundreds of systems in place. Yet, I know you will agree that their systems don't work in the virtual world. And so, because many are forced into, to, be, to move online now, I, I, I feel bad because we, we just haven't been prepared in this industry at all. And yet after reading your book, it really brought many ideas to the surface. And I have to share with you, there's two things that caught my eye and that, that virtual, first of all, vir virtual meetings don't have to suck <laughs> and they don't have to be dreadful to sit through um, another meeting. And secondly, that you actually showed us after reading your book, how to improve virtual meetings through all the challenging areas that we're faced with. And you did that by showing us examples, stories, graphics, templates, pictures, and even case studies. So when it comes to branding, um, this book information, I believe is the golden ticket to what the industry needs right now. So congratulations, my friend. Oh, thank you, Deborah. We've been friends for such a long time, and it's so great to see each of our success and come at different places and different times. So I really, really appreciate it. It's what I like to say. It's the gift that coronavirus has given me. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> So many new opportunities. And, and again, it was so, so needed. And, and reading your book um, was so inspiring to me. I had to finish it in one setting. Um, but what you did throughout the book is that you explained a six-step engagement method. And I'd like for us to go through those today um, one at a time because I want everybody out there, our viewers, to get a pen and paper. You're going to want to write down these six step engagement methods and use them for whatever Zoom meetings or if you're even hosting them or you're just attending them. John covers it all. So you want to walk us through all of this? Yes. You know, Deborah, ha haven't you heard the term Zoom fatigue more and more and more now? Oh, oh please, not again. <laughs> It's, it's really getting serious. So, but I think people are adding the word fatigue to virtually everything. But Zoom fatigue has really become a serious phenomenon. There is some serious research in there, like on the, the health pieces and the, the physical pieces. And so 
one of the really the, the pieces to try and create uh, something to counter that is uh, this engage method. So this six steps, if you do these six steps, your odds of your meeting being more engaging go up. And what I love to say about this is that there's an invisible timer. All of us come with an invisible timer, which is uh, when you log into a meeting, your timer starts to run, right? And when it's over, you are out. You want to log out, right? But there are different ways. You will speed the timer up. Like if my audio is bad, like as you can see here, I got a little bit of snow. I'm going to see if I'm going to fix this here in just a second. These are all things that contribute to that Zoom fatigue uh, and makes the timer go faster. But if you can do these things and make it more engaging, your timer can actually go longer. And so, Deborah, uh, I don't know if you heard this, right? But uh, we have at least my current record was a 16-hour Zoom. Oh, my gosh. It's oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm just saying, I don't recommend it for everyone, but it is possible and it was engaging. We had a collection of people with us. And so, yeah, so here I'll go through these six things and show you how we can potentially have a 16 hour Zoom or at least make your one hour Zoom more engaging, okay? Awesome, that sounds wonderful. Okay, so the letter engage. So write the word engage. Every letter stands for something. Every time you do one of these things, your odds of your meeting, uh, your virtual meeting being more engaging go way up. And so the first one, of course, is E, engage and interact with every attendee. So one of the keys here is to have a plan to engage and interact with every attendee. So we're probably on StreamYard right now. So if I probably go to Deborah's, uh, are we on Deborah's uh, homepage or are you on your HT Live page? I believe I'm on the live. Uh, great. So one of the things we can go to Hospitality Live there. And so the plan is actually, so if we can see any of the chats, Lisa, also, if you can private chat, uh, I know that you're on here, uh, anything from the Facebook Live page and put it on side of here, we'll interact with that. So from simple right. things to that to interacting with your audience, even on video, right? Trying to get everyone to do like some kind of Oprah or follow you, um, to a poll, to any of these, you know, any whiteboards, any of these tools are here to engage and interact with every attendee, have a plan to do it in your virtual meeting. And that's the first step. Okay, the next one is, uh, so so you know this, Deborah, you, you're you leading this meeting, right? But you got a Lisa here with you. Did yes. you try to lead any of these programs by yourself in the early stages? Oh yes, oh yes, but I, that didn't last very long. <laughs> That's why I had to get Lisa on board. I have a friend, she started her own Zoom meetings and here are all the things that she had to do. She wrote the marketing with the registration, set up her Zoom room, ran her own security, kept track of engaging with every person. She recorded and streamed to Facebook Live. She shared it on Slide Deck. She chatted with attendees while at presenting. She sat up uh, and ran the breakout room. She also sent a link and all the notes to everybody afterwards. And guess, Deborah, how, guess how she felt at the end? Oh. Oh my gosh, exhausting. <laughs> I know you're exhausted with listening to me right now. Yeah, she was completely- <laughs> the, That is a lot. And that's what happens here is that you forget in a virtual meeting, like in a physical meeting, well, okay, we can stand up and put a notebook down and maybe we're good. But here it's all this technology. And so the problem for the overwhelmed house, our, our solution is exactly this. Number two, N is never lead a meeting alone. Uh, this was actually given to me by one of my attendees and he coined the phrase, Never Zoom alone if you're on Zoom most of the time. Uh, and the key here is to, if you have a high value meeting with a collection of people, then find a way to not meet alone, which means get a producer, uh, you know, handle things like admitting people, handling the logistics, handling the chat room, so that you, Deborah, who I know is an amazing presenter, right? You can stay here. You can stay focused with your people. All right, and not have to do this. Haven't, haven't you ever seen a speaker do this and like, boom, the chat window hits and they do this? Oh yeah. And then, they tune, right <laughs> and then they, tune out, they tune out for a few seconds, all right? And but the problem is the audience is like, hello, we're over here. Yeah, so and never lead a meeting alone is one of the ways to do that. And I had a friend, she had a meeting that never ended on time. And so I suggested this tip to her. She got, she came back and she goes, I finally got my meeting to end on time. And I ended, uh, added back, 16 minutes of content and still ended on time. And I said, how'd you do it? And she goes, I didn't get one person. I got two. And then, you know, you and I work on leadership uh, succession. Um, those two people are also in training because she's going to leave this role in four months and she's training these people how to do this role and figure out one of the two, which one is she going to select to lead? Mm -hmm. So a bunch of benefits. So never lead a meeting alone. All right. Interesting. Yep. <clears throat> okay. The third one is uh, this one, bad backgrounds, right? So. Uh, here, wait, I think I can even do it. Well, I, oh, actually, I thought you were talking about me. I had to get my hair and makeup done. I got to look good. That's what I thought you were <laughs> until I started reading going, oh, okay. 
what I love about this, look, she has her hospitality day. She's, of course, she looked great, right? But there's sometimes when you come in there, uh, one of the most recent ones is we had somebody's home and everything around the camera was in her bedroom and it was kind of messy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And so these were all the different challenges that you have and that um, that you you get an insight of this. And uh, if you read the book Blink, Deborah, right, yeah. is that you know that I, I love Blink. Malcolm Gladwell says that we take our lifetime experience and we can snap judge things. And for the most part, you know, in your expertise, you can be right. And like negotiation, you could snap judge a negotiation right from the first word and going, oh, this is going to go great or uh, this is going to be trouble. It's not going to go great. Yeah, right. So yeah. This is why this next tip, the, the G in engage stands for this good looks. And well, and it seems like that's important to people. Um, I mean, you have a great virtual background with your book um, showing um, me. I've got a couple of shadows going on. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it seems like it's never perfect, but yours looks perfect. So it, I think it has a lot to do with not only reading your book, but becoming knowledgeable and experiment throughout, too. That's what we're doing here on the show every week. We're experimenting something new and different, right? Yeah, it's, and the funny part is I've been doing this for a decade. So what I love that you were talking about before is, right, while it's new for a lot of people, this new normal is old for a lot of uh, some of our meeting professional friends who have been experimenting with these ideas for years. This, right. uh, uh, and again, this is why I actually like regular or real backgrounds is because every time you change environments, we're in StreamYard today, you know, something changes, right? Okay. And yeah. sure. And uh, what I used to do is I create what I called Skype design offices, which is set up your computer or your camera in a location. And now it's like this, start to arrange all your items in the window so that, um, you know, that, 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 that you're mean, it's like, it's like you're setting up your office so that uh, people have an impression when they come into your office. And so. Right. Your but can you give a false impression? Can we give a false impression to people? Uh, you could give I've seen. Yeah, false you know, impression. Office. Yeah, I've, I've seen the, the the backgrounds that have like a grand piano in one corner and a big, huge fireplace in another. And it's like, I've been to your house before. You don't have that. So is there a false of way of looking good? Don't yeah. you want to be authentic and, and to yourself, you know, who you are, true to yourself? Well, I agree. Number one is these items here, all here have meaning to me, right? That's cool. That's part of the authenticity. So you can tell, like I've actually showed some other people's stuff and, and people know when it's staged and not staged. And I think right. you need to find that balance, but I also think you have to find the auth authenticity, which is you. And, um, and I, I, think, I think you're right. That authenticity piece is actually really important. So while these virtual backgrounds can transport you to all these locations, you also have to think in the end that the thing that's gonna serve you best is you know, things telling your client, your, your person who you're meeting uh, something about you. So like, obviously you're about hospitality, you're about speaking. Uh, these are all right. the, the hidden things that are, are communicated inside right. of that. And it's amazing how much it's communicated without people saying a word at all. Oh, I have a quote for this. Are you ready for right. this? Unless I can actually take this uh, to location to a competitive 50 meter swimming pool, I would be really happy. <laughs> I think that we were talking about making a virtual background for you that is your competitive pool with some trophies. And th I think I like there you go. Absolutely. My childhood trophies. <laughs> from a swimming pool uh, earlier on in Zoom. Anyways, the quote is this the background of our video conferences is key. Uh, let's see. Oh, we go. The background of our video conference is key to the image that we present our, of ourselves. I'll say it again. The background. Oh, yes of our video conference, right, is key to the image that we present of ourselves. There. Very good quote, very good quote. I like that, that is very true, extremely true. Okay, let's see, of course, the number, probably two problem is uh, people talking over each other, right? Have you ever been in that Zoom meeting, Deborah? Oh, I keep doing it to you right now. Is that what air co traffic control is? Oh, I, okay, I got it now, I got it. It happens Air all the time. How do you how do you not do that when the the airwaves are you know kind of lacking? It's kind of like when you watch a movie and their mouth is moving slower than their words. You know, it's it's, it's happening to us here right now. Why does that do that? Well, and the piece here too is like uh, what I kind of like to say is uh, whatever side you're on. I think recently we realized in a presidential debate that when two people talk at the same time, it's not engaging. No, it was. 
understands anything. You have to go backwards and say it again. And it's very frustrating in the audience. Even if you're not one of the speakers, it's very frustrating in the audience. So the key here is what I call air traffic control, which is manage the audio channel on your virtual meeting. Until our technology gets better, where you and I can talk at the same time, um, okay. now we have to institute some air traffic control. And it can be as simple as, oh, just raise your hand to talk. And for those who don't like that, there are a number of variety of other techniques uh, and like with you and I right now, we're just trying to do what we do normally in, in person, which was we're looking for that gap and that kind of cue of saying, oh, when should I say something next? Right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it is something that we have to control right now because it's, um, it's out of control a little. <laughs> but people have not been learning to present on on Zoom or any type of virtual. It's so different, especially for speakers like you and I, we're used to being on stage and being able to, to have that control, but yeah. now we really don't have that control. It, it's a lot more engaging, like you said. Well, and this is the role, like it, uh, I've sometimes had to step into other people's meetings if they don't have a host, right? I'll ask permission saying, oh, do you, do you mind if I kind of help, you know, moderate the conversation? And most people are like, please, right? Um, so that's, what, but if you are the host of a meeting, this is something I think is kind of your responsibility. You're making the culture of the meeting. And the culture of the meeting means, all right, are, when, are you gonna ask me questions and engage? Or is Deborah gonna talk for 60 minutes, right? <laughs> and I'm just gonna sit here as the guest, right? And so that's the cult, you, every minute you do that. So uh, actually here, I'll talk, can I talk one about our, our uh, well, let me uh, talk about one of our pet peeves. Absolutely. Uh, one of the pet peeves is to start a meeting late. And uh -huh. here's the reason why. All these amazing people logged in early sometimes to make sure they were here. And then you go, uh, we're going to wait a few minutes till the rest of the group gets here. Oh, oh, that gives me a headache thinking about that. It sends this unconscious message. Number one, I never have to be on time to your meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And two, right, is that, you know, uh, do you value my content or my time? I'm not sure. And so it sends this cascading spiral at the beginning. And so what I do is sometimes I have started meetings with nobody but me. <laughs> And I'll just start presenting, right? Because sometimes it's on Facebook Live, but so I'm presenting to everyone else. But as the people come on, right, then they, they suddenly realize, especially in my meetings that come multiple times, uh, they, uh, they suddenly realize, don't be late to John's meeting because two things will happen. He will start. And plus, <laughs> and two, if it's a work meeting, he's going to assign you something. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. That's anyway. engaging. That's being all engaging. I love it. Wonderful. Okay, number five. Number five, so number five is the challenge about working online. So many of you who have not been practicing before February or March, that you're having challenges working online. So from the simple problems of uh, remembering to unmute to the challenges of working on documents and actually making real decisions and, and doing business, uh, it's uh, people are having challenges working online. So the last G in Engage stands for get productive with virtual tools. And what I mean by that is look for all the tools that you have, chat, right, uh, the whiteboard, polling, but look for the other virtual tools that you have. So did you know as early as 10 years ago that 50 people could simultaneously edit uh, a Google Doc? 10 years ago? 10 years ago. I'm still trying to learn that. And so we show that. We show that during our first meeting and we actually get like, a, I had 22 uh, meeting professionals writing a poem in a webinar with MPI simultaneously. And what's amazing about it is that their, their light bulb goes on going, holy cow, because you're seeing 22 cursors move at the same time. That's great. That's, that's engaging. So that get, cool. get productive with the virtual tools, figure out which tools that you have. And, and what I like to say is get the right tool for the right job, but for the right people. If you have brand new people online, you're not gonna use some complicated tools. Start with chat and then work your way up. So get productive. Well, and that's where you need to know your audience. Exactly. Yeah. And you should know your audience because, and, and help them. If you have a not tech friendly audience, half of the tool you might work on is just getting them online. Right, right, right. Very good tip. Very good tip. And last but not least. Oh, uh, well, back to Zoom fatigue. Okay. So I told you my, my number was 16. How many maximum number of hours have you been on video in, um, in a day, Deborah? Oh, gosh. I mean, it, it can fluctuate between five, sometimes eight. <laughs> it depends. 
And have you it's ever a- have you ever passed out at the end of a day? Oh my That's- gosh. Yeah. Completely. I need a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know you like your wine too. So do I. So <laughs> I did, I had a specific two hour meeting. It was on a different platform and it was really intense. And what happened was is afterwards is I just went to my bedroom and boom, passed out. Oh my gosh. And when I woke up the next day, I'm like, what hit me? And so I started doing a bunch of research and I think there's cre- three key reasons here. Number one is you gotta build the muscles. And what I mean by that is if you haven't been meeting online before March and then you think you can do eight hours a day, it's like going to the swimming pool and doing, you know, uh, whatever, what's the longest, what's a, what's a long swim? What is it, three miles? Yeah, you can do 4,000 yards or 4,000 meters and without stopping. That's crazy to just jump in and do that. Yeah, if you try and do 4,000 meters and you never swam before, you're gonna hurt. Yeah, yeah. Video meeting is exactly the same way. Number one, you don't have the muscles. Number two is if you have problems, right? If my audio starts, no, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> you scared me there for a minute. <laughs> I know Lisa's like, where's the button, right? <laughs> no, so if your audio goes out, like, like I said, this, I'm having a little bit of this. This is, I know, causing some of this Zoom fatigue when your video doesn't work correctly and when other people's right. virtual backgrounds don't work right. Anyways, you got to spend right. more energy to tend. I know when, when like uh, somebody's audio starts going, I lean in and I have to start like use a lot of energy going, what are you trying to say? And then the last one is, if we, you and I were not engaging uh, speakers or hosts, then it's gonna take somebody a lot of energy to be here. So the last piece that we have is, e is end your meeting on high note. And what I mean by that is architect different high notes or pieces of engagement in your meeting. And really plan your virtual meeting so that you do something in the last five minutes. This comes from product market research. And it says that in a 60 minute demo, if you do something that ends on a high note in the last five minutes, people are more likely to buy your product. Your virtual meetings are exactly the same. Oh, that's a, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Because you're leaving them on a positivity, a high that they just enjoyed the the time with you. um, And that helps them also remember a lot of things. They're more likely to come back, they're more likely to show up on time, and they're likely to be ready and energized to go. And buy your product or services. Yeah, that yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Something, then, a lot yeah. Of sense. So just make sure that you, you know, you really get them on a high note. It could be a great quote. It could be some kind of engagement or call to action, as they always say, um, to get them motivated for their day or what a, what they've been assigned with. That makes a lot of sense because a lot of times we'll just drop off. Bye, everybody. Hi. See you later. And everybody's like, okay. And you know, you have a lot of these, you know waving hands going off everywhere. But uh, but I think a high note is extremely, extremely important because majority of the time, that's probably the last thing they're gonna actually remember too. So you gotta catch them when you can. Yeah, exactly. You know, you saw that funny, probably viral video where everyone's like the end of every Zoom meeting. Bye-bye. Bye, bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's bye-bye. It's awkward. It's <laughs> awkward is the big you know, gap. So yeah, end your meeting on a <laughs> Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So that that was really, really great information. Thank you so much. But what that does is it it draws attention to, and I, I know I'm sure other people have questions that I'd like to bring in here. Um, and those of you that are just joining us, we have wonderful John Chan, the author of um, Engaging Virtual Meetings, a fabulous, fabulous book. I mean, I was just, I couldn't put it down. So, but one thing that I really know that a lot of people are concerned about when it comes to virtual meetings, John, is, and one of the biggest and most hidden secret to virtual meetings is security. And you mentioned it earlier, you know, there's those Zoom bombers, there's unwanted intruders that want to come in and play. And in your book, you mentioned three practices that people can incorporate. And one of them was, um, I believe, you know, first of all, you have to have your separate password, which is really important because you don't want other people to know about your password. And, and then you said, enable the, the waiting room feature, enable that part and dedicate a person to, to invited people in. So what you're doing is you're dedicating one person to that waiting room, which I thought was a fabulous idea. And then you said, don't post the link on social media. Now, we all do that. 
So I know I'm curious and I'm sure our viewers are curious. What did you mean by that? And, and tell us more about those three practices. So, uh, and I, I got to give a shout out to both David Kleeman who said, nice move on my audio fake. And then Ann King said, come on, Deb, even 1500 can seem long, 1500 meters. <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about security. And, and another thing that I suggest inside of there is to turn off screen sharing by default. So let me just, uh, I'll share a couple of stories. Zoom bombing is a new phenomenon. And people can come in and if they get your link, there are a collection of people who just spend their time jumping through links or sharing it through other resources and having other people jump in and disrupt meetings. And if you don't know what you're doing, your only recourse is to end your meeting or suffer what they're gonna come and bring to you. And let me tell you, it's not nice and it's not friendly uh, and it is, is definitely not engaging, but uh, we've been able to take control of that. And so uh, the other one, again, is that you go into sharing and by default, you turn it off so only the host can share and then you manually turn it on for your guests because that's also another technique. A Zoom bomber will come in. If they have permission to share a screen, they will share a not nice video and start annotating not nice things. So uh, my most recent story, which I think you're really gonna enjoy, is that we were test tri trialing uh, Engaging Virtual Santa. So uh, I'm just releasing the website for it, engagingvirtualsanta.com, and uh, we're gonna try and spread some holiday cheer. So we were doing this about a month or two ago, and somebody came in and Zoom bombed our meeting. Uh, because again, I publicly put out, I said, join Santa, and every time I put it out publicly, that's the easiest way for them to go in and get the, the link. When again, when there were no passwords and no um, uh, waiting rooms, they could just jump right in. So anyway, so I saw these Zoom bombers. We didn't know who they were. We came in, we brought them in. Uh, we watched them carefully and they came in and, and uh, Deborah, you're not going to uh, believe this, but it was like things like Nazi flags and other things. So we took them out of the meeting and then they came back in the waiting room. And so we go, hey, do you want to reverse Zoom bomb these people? And I had an audience of about 14 and they said, yeah, let's do it. So I told everyone turn off their cameras and we literally had Santa Claus and one of my good meeting friends, he had snap camera, he was a cookie. So he was a cookie with a mouth so he could talk. And so the Santa and the cookie had an innocuous conversation going on. I let the two Zoom bombers in. They didn't have their cameras on. And so about a minute after they start talking, the Zoom bombers come in and start saying not nice things. So what I did was immediately grab control, muted them, removed their ability to unmute and everybody turned their cameras on and Santa proceeded to tell these two Zoom bombers what not nice children they were. And <laughs> later on, we actually posted it to Twitter and we said, you know, what's worse than Zoom bombing is getting reverse Zoom bombed and getting it, uh, re getting reverse Zoom bombed by Santa and a cookie and have it publicly acknowledged on Twitter. <laughs> That is so funny. Well, then the beauty of that, though, John, is that you were actually prepared. And so if other people are prepared by Zoom bombers and they get bombed, uh, something like that really threw them off. <laughs> And if you, there's lots and lots of stories about it. And again, if you have a host or if you have a producer who knows how to handle this, they can keep right. your meeting safe. They can keep, that's part of it being engaging is creating a safe environment. And they can take care of those people immediately. I was actually on a meetings industry happy hour and we got Zoom by like, I don't know, like 12 or 14 people. And, wow. but I, we worked as a team. I said, I'm actually gonna try and let all these people in, but I need your help. So all these meeting professionals had never seen this. People like Corbin Ball was on this call. And everyone was fascinated. They're going like, what's John going to do with this? <laughs> so we worked together as a team, identified it and kicked people one out at a time and regained the control. And then we had this really fascinating industry conversation going, you know, this is the future of virtual meetings. What are we going to do to deal with this? And so we had a great conversation. Oh my gosh. Well, you were very prepared and you kind of have to go with the flow and, uh, and, and acknowledge that they're there so that they know that they're there and uh, to keep them on their toes, Santa thing. I mean, tis the season. So that was perfect timing. <laughs> perfect timing. Well, and we have another question for you, John. As a matter of fact, Lisa, who we just had on the show, she actually wants to know, are smaller or larger virtual meetings easier to manage or does it even matter? That's a great question. Well, I would say this, it depends. And what I mean by that is if you had a larger virtual meeting, but it was only webinar, 
you kind of only have a less things to deal with. Like you and I might be the only people who are panelists who have video on, everybody else is just watching. So quote unquote, that's easier. But to me, very few webinars are engaging. Like you got to work really, really hard because you're missing this channel, right? You don't see the audience reaction. So um, I do believe, let's see now, smaller or larger meetings easier to manage. Like I said, and then I think it goes back into depends. Smaller is obviously better if you're trying to co-create, have a conversation, collaborate, and be engaging. There are some things that don't work. So like we do a check-in, right? So at the beginning of a meeting, one of the openers might be, hey, you know, Deb, tell me something great that happened in the last week, right? But if you do that with 500, that's your meeting. Your meeting's not <laughs> over. You didn't get to everybody. And so you, I, I just think, I don't know if it's easier, but it takes definitely different styles of management to handle a small meeting versus a large meeting. And oh. making large meetings engaging, I think, is a, a different ball of wax. So I would imagine. And, and that's where you need a different type of staffing um, and production crew to help with the behind the scenes. Because, again, it's all about the behind the scenes. You know, you got to make sure you have the right Wi-Fi. You got to make sure you have the light, right lighting. We get back all to the basics again about putting together a virtual meeting. So are, are there any um, any conferences? I mean, there, there are, I know there are some conferences that actually do it right. And as a matter of fact, in your book, you mentioned about the Green Meeting Industry Council um, back in 2011. So obviously they did something right. What was it, John? In the Green Meetings Industry Council, they took some quote unquote risks and I love that. And what I mean by that is that uh, one is that he actually turned the whole conference into a team building exercise to help create um, the, you know, you know, the two reasons really why we meet education and networking. So by building a team, we were meant to stay together and 10 to 20 of us were in a team and really, really got a chance. Now, the second thing they did, this is right when, remember when the iPad came out? Holy cow, that seems like four. <laughs> that was so exciting. <laughs> they were able to get one iPad and assign it to every team. And that alone was another engagement factor. So, cause we just, I just wanted to see it. I didn't have an iPad yet at the time. And I wanted to see would an iPad make a difference in my day-to-day -day work. I could try it out now for three or four days as part of this council. And then the last piece they really did is that the teams worked inside of, um, uh, on a case study by the end of the, the program. And so in our case study, we had like 20 industry professionals work out how to save 50% of the money and save 50% of the carbon. But here's the secret. Right. You know, Samuel J. Smith. Yes. Yes. He's another one of our very good industry friends. I actually just got to catch up with him uh, a month ago, but he nice. came and we put a call out and saying, does, cause they, this was running hybrid. So it was meaning that they were live casting and having a Twitter feed and some other things trying to get other people an early, early experiment in GMIC. And uh, Sam was one of them who set up his whole home office to watch GMIC and attend virtually. So we came out and we said, does anybody on the virtual world want to join our team? And Sam goes, yeah, I'll join, right? Oak team is the best. And he goes, okay, I'm in. So <laughs> join the team. I actually brought him in on a laptop and Skyped him into a meeting. So his video face was in our circle of 10 or 12 people. Wow. And he really made a contribution. And I think it was our first insight of seeing that participating virtually can be engaging and you can be a valued member if you just do it right. Wow. And that's the key. You got to do it right as much as you can. I know there's a lot of forgiveness right now in the virtual world, but uh, I believe um, it's really important to, to do the best you can. And everybody knows that. So um, I think it's uh, I think it's here to stay. Don't you think? Yes, I have two pieces for that. One is, you know, one is is uh, I like to tell people is make your own culture for your virtual meetings. And one of the things in our virtual meetings since April, I got tired of people apologizing for stuff they had no control over. Right. right? right. It just happens, right? Like now, like Deborah and I, we have to deal with 22 time zones or 24 time zones around the world. It's so easy to like mess up, right? So I try to have some grace. So one of our cultural pieces is what we call the no sorry zone. Ah. And so you never have to apologize in my virtual meeting for anything, right? You had to leave and feed your, you know, feed your kid, do that. That's important, right? Your pet needs attention. Sure. Fine. Right. Don't have to apologize for that. Or it's like, and it was because we're really all doing the best that we can, right? Unless you're doing malice, like you're a zoom bomber, that's different. You should say sorry. But if you're just trying to participate, no sorry zone. So that's number one. Um, and then, uh, 
the number two is just uh, having grace in this, right? We, we do have some grace in terms of being able to work with all this, but is it here to stay? Somebody just asked me that. He's releasing a book in March of 2021, and he's, he asked me, do I plan for a physical book party or what? And my personal guidance right now, I, I don't have no crystal ball, but oh, well, I got this thing up here. But what I like to say is that um, I'm personally planning that it's gonna be the same for a long time. And that helps me in my decision-making. And if it opens up any earlier than that, to me, that's just gonna be gravy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's you. Well, okay, so let's talk about that. We, we want it to stay, but what is the future though? I mean, of virtual meetings when there is such a big push to get back to face-to-face, -face? how does that, balance? How does that look? Um, is it going to get better? I mean, it, it'll stay, but, and they're saying hybrid, but what, what does the future actually look like? Because there's no doubt they said 83% of people that are at home working right now would rather be at in-person events. So, and it's going to, it's, those sure. numbers are going to go up as we get, you know, closer to the opportunity to do that. Will virtual be forgotten overall? Or, I mean, What's your thought process on that? Yeah, I, again, I have no crystal ball, but I do have a couple of these things, right? Number one is that uh, Twilio did research and said that this pandemic has pushed our information technology seven years in advance yeah. forward. In just so that's you really kind of mind blowing when you think about that, that people we've been saying get online for all the time. I've been trying to sell online team building for like 10 years and, and but now, you know, there was very little business, but March, oh, suddenly people were interested. So I mm. think that's mm. one, the future, um, you know, the, the challenge, Deborah too, and I, as much as you want everything to open up and when you, the possibility of getting sick or dying from a meeting changes the dynamic radically. Sure. Especially as a, as a planner, uh, because if you're the person responsible for that event, just my ethics and integrity, I would have such a hard time with that. So what I can say is, is this, going forward, people are gonna start pushing virtual. This is why I'm working on a green screen and a bunch of other things is because soon I'm gonna be able to put myself in like a three-dimensional set and, and if that's gonna help me communicate my message to you. You know, I've already innovated things like what you can't see here is I'm sitting in front of six screens now, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> and all this lighting and yeah, yeah, and that is true. This microphone I've had for professionally speaking, but I just now hooked it up to my computer and now I use it every day. And I'm like, so that's what I think is that you're going to see people move on the technology. Uh, and, and I do believe even when we open up, it's going to take a while. So there's still going to be hybrid. And so if you know these virtual skills, it's going to work. And like I said, if it opens up, I, we're going to get back to face to face. And here's the reason why for me. You know, now you know about bandwidth, right? Like if you've had low bandwidth and, and you saw someone freeze, you know what happens. And what, oh, yeah. I, what I like to say is in face-to-face, -face, when we're meeting uh, with each other, that's the maximum amount of bandwidth you're ever going to have. You know, you can see things, you can smell things, which you can't do right now. You can feel things like you can have that stuff, you know, intuitions that come while you're meeting. Uh, and so people will return to that when they can. And now that they've seen some of this future, they will now consider more though. I still think virtual, now that everyone's over the hump of going, well, at least it's possible, they can now substitute it when it makes sense. So that's my best. And then the last part I have is uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. I think there's some other future thing. When somebody gets it right, it's gonna blow up. Oh yeah, I'm excited for that. I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. But overall, I think what's happening here, John, is that we're reaching more people on a global basis, much easier than ever before. There was that push when we were face-to-face -to, -face to bring the international attendees over to the US and the US over to international waters, but it's, it's not as impactful as it has been these last couple months to actually reach out on a global basis. And that alone is extremely exciting, especially for the speaking world. As a matter of fact, Lisa has um, a question for you because you know the speakers are very involved with the virtual world. And she said, of course, you know they spend thousands of dollars, which we talked 
talked about earlier before you came on the show, they think they can speak, be the producer, they can do everything. Um, is that really realistic? Because what do clients really want from speakers when it comes to virtual meetings? Because right now speakers are pushing out there, hey, I can do it all, I can do it. You don't have to do it, you don't have to lift a finger. I'll do it all for you. But is that realistic? Uh, it can be, I, I think there's two parts here. There are certain talks where you can create, where you can be the producer and smooth over it. So, uh, but you gotta be a great multitasker. You have to already have the skills. So Deborah, you already know, like being a speaker and watching the chat, right? And watching the attendee window, right? As watching the video gallery at the same time is a challenge. It's right? like, where do I go? <laughs> oh, you'll love this. So we have something called, and you know, in lifeguarding, you know what they call uh, scanning? What is it? Scanning, I think. Uh, oh. In lifeguarding, you know what they do is what they're always scanning. Scan like up that. and down the beach. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I do as a producer. If you have a great producer, you're scanning. But the problem when you're right, Lisa, is when you're a speaker and you're scanning, every time I do this, I disconnect with the audience, right? Reconnect. Absolutely, disconnect. right? Yes. Yeah. And so is it realistic? Eh, there, like I said, some talks can make it. But if you really want to be engaging, again, that's why I say never lead a meeting alone. Um, there, I've seen some other speakers too work some stuff where they work together as, as a team to bring some things, but they have a remote where they can do these transitions, like change their background, change the camera to another angle. It took them time to set it up, whether they did it or had some help, but there is a way to do that. And so uh, watch all your friends from the National Speakers Association, which Deborah's also a member, is because a lot of them are innovating. Uh, they but, are. They are. But, but Lisa, to get back to your last question, what do clients really want? In the end, number one, you want content. And two, you want a great speaker that kept your audience engaged virtually. If yep. you if it's just pure entertainment, then you have to say it's pure entertainment. Because I know I've watched great speakers, all this amazing stuff, and you're like, but what, what are you saying for me? Um, and then there comes the other speakers who have great content, terrible microphone, bad background. And you're just like, I can't even hear the message because I can't even hear you. So, right, right, right. It's all got a balance. And if Zach is still on the watching here, I know he has some input into that as well because he, he actually has the keyboard. You do too, John. The keyboard system where you kind of, you know, know where your typing keys are. Um, and that that helps quite a bit too, having that right in front of you to push the buttons instead of going this way or that way at the same time. So um, great, great questions there. And, and we're open to uh, more as a matter of fact, before we close out here with John. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm just curious of, um, you know, what, um, what one advice ab above and beyond your wonderful six step uh, engagement uh, method, what, what is that one advice that you feel would really make a difference to the virtual world in general? Um, that it could be anything. It, it could be, uh, you know, what each and every one of us can do, or maybe companies and organizations can do. Um, what is it? What does that look like? That one piece of advice or suggestion? So I recently got the opportunity to talk to the International Coaching uh, Federation or Foundation in in Florida, and what happened is that the light went on for them. Because what they suddenly realized is that many of them are great coaches, but they're not great technologists. That's not why they got in the business. And one of the things that I showed them was how to use the basic set of technology. So this audio video channel, number one, number one engaging tool. The chat window is the number two engaging tool. Yeah, breakout rooms is kind of techie, but the number three engagement tool. If you have some combination of those, in the end, what advice I can give is to go back to that content and how you present it. Those coaches all had the light bulb go on and saying, oh, now, as long as I can come here and communicate with my audience, now I can go back and do the things that I do great as a coach, interacting with people or a group of people and making that meaningful. So, uh, you know, Elizabeth Clow, right? Yes. We are writing, and I, hopefully, Deborah, uh, maybe I'll ask you for a contribution. We are rewriting a new meetings manifesto. And we're looking for statements in there. And one of the statements is, I want a virtual meeting that makes me cry in a ah. good way. Right. And do you know what I mean? Like, like we, 
we can create emotion here on these virtual meetings because we're humans. That's what we do. It takes some extra and different effort, but it can be done. So That's we want virtual meetings that make us cry in a good way, not cry in a bad way. Yeah, right, right. No, I, I think that um, that is what people need at the same time, because you're not in a room full of people like we, we're used to feeling the vibes from. We're alone. We're in the room by ourselves. And that's unusual for people. And so whether it's engaging um, by making them cry and feeling good um, or doing some other type of engagement uh, is, is going to be key. As a matter of fact, I want to share with our viewers one way that you actually keep people engaged. <laughs> and it's this. <laughs> <laughs> Your pajamas. You're going to have to tell us a little bit about this type of engagement. And of course, you're a Seahawk fan. We know that. Thank goodness. <laughs> I know you're in Arizona. I know, I know, I know. But um, so the, the story behind this, right? Number one is hopefully that made you smile and laugh. And if it that did, hit the awesome. chat room. That and is so awesome. The second part around the story is that <clears throat> I was just fed up. It was like our third stay at home order here in Washington State. And I was just kind of like, I'm holding in there, but today I'm just kind of done with it, right? And and so I said, I'm gonna, I had four classes to teach. I taught four classes in a onesie. And people would yeah. log on and then they would immediately just start laughing. And then I'd have to tell the story, just saying, I'm look, I'm fed up. Feel free. Like people like brought hats and fun. Some people went and changed and got in their pajamas and joined me. And oh my you know, we we made jokes about this. This is the one, you know, thing that you can you can meet in your pajamas. So let's do it. Right. If we said we wanted to do it now, the follow up story to this is I, I run a karaoke <clears throat> quarantine karaoke .com, every Saturday at 9 p.m. And last weekend, um, uh, I so talk about Deborah, talk about meetings that make you cry. A friend of mine, ha his wife passed away suddenly hmm. and I volunteered to run his memorial for his wife. Virtually. Virtually. And. 150 families called in representing about 300 to 400 people from around the world, Switzerland, Germany, United States, East Coast, and, and people cried. I mean, talk about a meeting that, that made people cry. People missed this, this woman. She made such an impact on people's lives. Wow. And my, my job as the producer was to try and help that. Like, I did not know her personally, right. but I got that and I helped facilitate that for other people. And so... Uh, later in the day, in karaoke, that was what I did in the morning. Later in the night in karaoke, I'm like, normally it's all crazy and, and all energetic. And I, I showed, we all put our pajamas on. And so I said, this edition was all about chill, meaning like, we're just going to like, put your pajamas on. We don't have any energy. We're all going to sing slow songs today. And it was really impactful. And so that pajama came back out again. And that's, that's some of the things I think you can do here in virtual that oh, you have. Yeah, that's, that was such a great idea. And yeah, it doesn't matter if it's really a, a real emotional cry or a happy cry. Um, a pajama party can definitely turn some some happy faces here and there for sure definitely well and and king actually had a question for you as well and my girlfriend I, I totally adore she says besides your book which is the awesome book is there a learn how to run type of zoom 101 which is where we all need to start <laughs> i know it's zoom 101 yeah again if you just got online if you're still trying to figure out your background if you're still trying to figure out your lighting you're in zoom 101 and and uh, again, what I love to tell people, Deborah, is that uh, I don't make vaccines. That's just not not what I can do. Right. But I kept the virtual meeting, you know, a little more engaging. And so uh, I run multiple classes, and uh, it's at engagingvirtualmeetings.com. Again, engagingvirtualmeetings.com. And I run any, uh, a level one class, and that's the first place. Learn how to run Zoom 101. And I teach these six principles, but more importantly, demonstrate them with a group of probably 10 to 20 people. And when you see it, you're like, Oh, I can do that, right? And that's what we really want to show. And I've heard people say that. They come out of that class, and I've had somebody who used something in one of their meetings. Their meetings were disasters beforehand. And they, she said, may I just run like 10 minutes of openers and it, in, the, in this uh, business meeting? And she did. She said they got more done in that 90-minute that, uh, meeting that they had online, and they got more done all through the day. So that's what I can best wow. say. 
uh, with that is, you know, come watch, watch somebody, whether it's me, there's many other people who are really good at this. Go find who they are and watch them. This is you and I are, I go to a lot of online webinars and just watch your reactions going, oh, I don't want to go back to that one, but that one, I want to know who that person is. And I love that technique and I'm going to borrow it. Wow, that's a great another idea because I think a lot of people are are still afraid of it and they're they're wanting to be so perfect in their own Zoom world and little do they know they can learn by going to go to other ones. So and I highly recommend uh, hopping on board and checking out just like we're doing here, um, seeing what other people are doing because that's a that's a great great idea. And again, if everybody wants to connect with John. Uh, information is down below but i highly recommend getting the book <laughs> i mean it was a game changer for me and really you pushed me john and i to the to the level that i'm like i've got to get this up to par because it's the only way to go and uh, like you said besides content and and engagement your setup is going to have to be very important too. So I really, really appreciate that. And as um, uh, Lisa went ahead and, and definitely just kind of wrapped up um, what your your six steps were for engagement. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. E is for engagement and interact with every attendee. N is never lead a meeting alone, and I can vouch for that. Um, G is good looks. A is air traffic control, and oh, we need to be more cognizant to that, don't we? Uh, G is get productive with virtual tools, and that's that can include creativity, what's going on there. And E as uh, end on a high note. And so I think what we should do is end on a high note here with John by thanking him very, very much. Um, while we may be able to, you know, I, I don't know about you, John, but I, I know I can't predict the future. Um, or I could tell you that the Cleveland Browns is going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> but we hope that technology becomes a reality in our favor, especially when we get back to face to face and having virtual meetings help us with our day to day interactions can easily happen with John's six step engaging methods. So everybody, please get a copy, contact him um, and, and he will definitely be delighted to show you the way. So want to definitely thank you so much, John. You really uh, nailed it for us, and we really appreciated having you on today. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much, Lisa, too, and everybody who tuned in. We appreciate you all, and hopefully we'll see you online. Okay, thank you so much. Well, and if you want to see this episode again, or maybe you want to share it, with others, you know, just go to Hospitality Today Live uh, YouTube channel or even our Facebook page. As we don't need to register, you just hop on board and uh, you can see all the replays, including this one as well. And if you have any questions or you would like to be on the show or sponsor the show like Pickles did today, uh, just contact us at hello at hospitality live.com and in the meantime do join our online community for more upcoming shows information and resources so we really want to thank lisa Freeman and john chan for being with us today now coming up on our next show we will have jacqueline zindran now jacqueline is the vice president of events with cure psp and jacqueline will talk about the importance of event associations why event associations are a wonderful place for people to get involved whether it's for networking education or even career growth and on top of that, she says that nonprofits are more than just galas. And she's going to tell us why that is is. So don't miss next Tuesday's show right here on HTL. I'm Deborah Gardner, and thank you for joining us. Have a productively busy and successful week, everybody. Mm -hmm.